for. Um, yes, at least an introduction on topic. So I will know about that it exists. We have seen. Okay. But we never entered. Okay. Okay. Great. So the the main goal is to go a little bit deeper into the concept of the planetary boundaries. Um, I have a, a more of a technical background on these questions, so I will talk a little bit more on, on the, the question of technical aspects of what are planetary boundaries. I understood that the background that you have is mostly on a social science approach uh, of these questions. I'm very much into systemic approach and uh, crossing um, more technical and social approaches, so I'll, I hope I'll manage uh, to to uh, create a debate uh, that mixes these two uh, approaches. Um, so um, first thing, just to share a little bit about uh, me and why I'm here today. Um, it's a big question. How do you end up um, talking about planetary boundaries to a, a group of international students? Um, I will try to make it short, but I think when I was about 20 years old, I, I really got a shock when I discovered the question of the unsustainability of the way that we live, especially I'm French, so especially in French countries, um, very much with heavy consumption of um, uh, fossil fuels for everything in our lives. Um, and I discovered more or less suddenly um, that all our life was based on these fossil fuels that it created a, a climate change that could lead even possibly to the extension of humanity. And that um, we had in particular in France and in Europe, no fossil fuels. So I just, for me, it was just totally crazy. Like every act I would do in a day would sound not possible for me. Um, like I could not go into a car and I could not eat meat or I could not turn on the heat anymore. Like I had done this for 20 years of my life and more or less suddenly, uh, I just realized that it was not possible to live like this. So um, I think it was difficult. Um, I don't know what's the state uh, for you about this question. Uh, maybe it's something that you have since you were born. Uh, maybe it's something you realize recently, uh, but you all have different backgrounds also, and we all have different um, uh, concerns about the question. I think my life was a very easy one for 20 years uh, because I live in a rich country where life conditions are, I feel, very uh, um, uh, easy. And um, it was also a, a sudden discovery of the very um, inst instability of, our, of what we had built as uh, industrial countries. Um, what happens after this when you realize um, now I'm very happy because I, I, I hear a lot about eco-anxiety, about all the things that you go through. And I discovered that what happened to me was quite normal. And I was at a conference a few weeks ago and there were psychologists and they said, now we are concerned about the people who are not eco-anxious, not about the eco-anxious because it's more normal to be eco-anxious than the opposite. So it was quite a relief for me to hear this. Um, I think I went more or less up and down, but the main thing is that I studied as an engineer and I, my, my, my comprehension of the, the problem was, is there, what is the kind of job that I can do that is coherent and interesting with the scale of this problem? Like if, if this question of this unsustainability of our way of living um, is and needs such radical changes, then what seems natural uh, 20 years ago is not and is, is, is maybe nonsense. And uh, for me, it was very, um, it, it created two difficulties. First, the fact that it was not very much shared in, in the society 20 years ago, um, in France at least. And the second difficulty is how do you find something, I mean, job, something you do in your life um, that uh, makes sense for you? So it has been quite a long way on this uh, uh, question. And I think one of the main questions I've always had is try to understand the problem. So I think I've been spending a lot of time in the last 20 years trying to understand the problem. I worked for the Ministry of Ecology in France uh, or for different uh, public um, institutions um, for a few years where I was more in operational uh, problems, uh, but very much concerned with this. And um, I stopped working uh, when my first child was born. 
I took a time to think about what I wanted to do. And I ended up trying a job, which is completely incredible. Researcher, I am paid to think about this problem and trying to find a way to go forward. I, it's just incredible. I think I was, I, I was not aware 20 years ago that that kind of job existed. Uh, and I have this task to think about these problems and trying to find a way to think of them and go forward. And the second task is to share it with people like you. And when I think of what I can do that makes sense, I found these things like share the information. And so I'm very happy today, <laughs> 20 years after, to be with you and share this with you uh, because I think it makes sense. And uh, so I hope I, 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 I managed to share this uh, uh, correctly with, with you. This picture is to show that I, I was, um, I think, also quite connected to my environment uh, when I was walking in the mountains in France. We have lovely sceneries. And in our industrial countries, we are, I think, very much disconnected. Nobody knows where the water comes from. You just open the tap and it comes. And nobody knows where the food comes from. Um, nobody knows the name of any plants that are surrounding us. We don't know what we depend on. And I think I was that kind of urban product. Um, and I think I had some connectedness uh, when I was in, in walking uh, that probably created the conditions for me to be sensitive to this question, okay, what do I rely on? And uh, how can we make these things um, work correctly uh, for, for everybody uh, and not only, of course, uh, me? So yeah, just a quick glimpse on how I ended up doing this. And I've been a researcher now for eight years. Um, and I'll present what I'm doing uh, uh, afterwards. I, so my background is engineer. I did my research mostly uh, with a, um, an entry in biogeochemistry. So I am very much uh, into the how does the planet works and how does the interaction between the different uh, living uh, beings on the planet uh, work. Uh, and I oriented my research in the hope for a systemic approach uh, that is understanding the interaction between this phys physical description, biophysical description of our world and the interaction with the social context, the cultural context of our society. Um, so I work in the fields of socioecology, our um, uh, territorial ecology, uh, fields where we try to think uh, at the same time of these biophysical and social cultural aspects of our of our lives um are, are we uh, going to be able to take this off it, do i no i cannot do it um on peut enlever juste le bandeau au dessus pour uh, c'est sur l'ordi là merci um so this is a, a famous picture uh by, uh, by NASA in 1972 of, of our planet. Uh, the question of planetary boundaries is, of course, about the planet. Uh, our planet has um, approximately 4 billion year old story that has come to... Um, uh, um, and we are now in a point where we, we our relationship with this planet has radically changed. I like this, this image of uh, the way that our relationship to the planet was um, apprehended before was like it's something that dominates us. Uh, there are there are natural powers that are stronger than us, and this uh, shows uh, shows it. Um, but this doesn't work anymore now. Nope. Thank you. No, too many to click. No. Okay, it works. Thank you. Um, and now we have been on the moon. I mean, we, some people, <laughs> have been on the moon and look at the planet Earth from there. So we have completely changed our view. Um, we are more now in the idea of dominating, uh, at least in the view that we have on this planet Earth, which changes completely uh, the way uh, that we think about it. Ça va? Alors, par contre, à chaque fois que tu interviens, je peux plus zapper après. C'est en russe, c'est ça? ça. Hein? Des fois, j'aurais des trucs en bas, mais on peut le baisser plus bas ou pas? 
Ah, tout marche. Le voir un peu. Ok, ok, bon, c'est pas Ça marche. C'est bon yeah. Ouais, ouais. Um, am I clear when I talk? Everybody understands uh, correctly? It's fine? Yeah? Don't hesitate uh, to raise your hand or uh, ask anything if you, if you need. Um, and so the, 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 our planet has had the, what usually people call the emergence of life. Life is supposed to have appeared on planet Earth a few uh, billion years ago. And, um, but I like the, the, the work that have, have done people like uh, Herbert Reeves or James Lovelock and Liv, Lynn Margulis on the question of life. And what they, they state is that has life appeared on planet Earth or is planet Earth um, alive in the, in the end? That's a way to, to, to say it. Um, for example, Herbert Reeves, who is astrophysicist, he uh, states that life is a property of matter. Life is always present in any matter, and uh, it only appears more or less that this matter is living. So it's not that you have human beings somewhere and, uh, sorry, uh, living beings somewhere and um, uh, non living beings uh, in another section. You have just matter. This matter has the property of being alive, and this property of being alive will be uh, more easily seen or expressed in some conditions. That's an interesting definition by Herbert Reeves. And what James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis uh, stated is the Gaia hypothesis. Do you know about the Gaia uh, hypothesis? It's an uh, important landmark in the, in the history of, uh, of ecology. Uh, it's a hypothesis that the whole planet Earth can be described as a living organism, which is uh, uh, also, um, uh, which, go which goes uh, with the definition given by, by uh, Herbert Reeves. I'm sorry, I'll just move it. Uh, because sometimes it's down, sometimes it's up, and uh, maybe in the middle. <laughs> you don't know. You don't know how to get it up. Um, do you know when it's written in? Tu sais quand c'est écrit en français? Uh, comment on l'enlève? C'est juste on peut pas. Pardon? Ah ben voilà. Merci, super. Et voilà, excellent. Merci beaucoup. Um, what has happened on planet Earth since since? Uh, The four billion years is that this expression of life has grew has grown bigger and bigger. This is a way to measure maybe the the living activity of planet Earth. It's the primary production. It's the quantity of algae or plants that produce organic matter that produce what we call now uh, living beings. And you can see that from the start of the earliest biosphere to the different states uh, of the evolution of life, we have had much more production of life on this planet, billion years after billion years. And um, here you can see also in the last 500 million years, the evolution of diversity. Um, and what you see is that we have had more and more diversity on the planet Earth. So the planet Earth is, well, I personally find it uh, quite fantastic to think of this life uh, being a, a, a possibility that has been expressed more and more, million years after million years, and strengthening because each uh, living beings in, interact with another, with other living beings, and also with the mineral composition of the planet Earth. When uh, James Lovelock uh, started working on the question of life, on life, he was working for the planet for NASA for the planet Mars, and the question was, is there life on Mars? And his answer was, if you want to know if there are living beings on Mars, you must look at what we call mineral things like the atmosphere, the oxygen, the, 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 the ocean, the, the water, the, the rocks, because in fact, on the planet Earth, everything is determined by, by life. The, 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 the composition of the atmosphere, the composition of the ocean, the rocks, everything that we have is, uh, uh, is more or less linked to life. For example, in Paris here, we are walking on stones that are limestone that, are, that have been created by millions of years of shells that have deposited in the, in the, on, the, um, on the oceans. And we are in fact always walking on dead living being, beings that, that lived before. And, and so this question of uh, everything on planet Earth, nearly everything expresses this life and has been expressing it more and more million years after million uh, years. Now, if we look a little bit closer to the last 
uh, this is thousands of years, so this is 100 thousands of years ago. Uh, we have been in a, in, a, in a period of quite cold weather. Uh, it's called the glacial cy cycle on planet Earth. And since the last 10,000 years, we have been in a, in a state of the Holocene period. Holocene period is a period of very great stability of climate and, in general, uh, planet Earth uh, uh, functioning. So um, this is the, the, the moment when the first uh, fully modern humans um, went out of Africa and started to spread all over the continents. And this is 10,000 years ago, the beginning of agriculture. And agriculture started because also, and managed to spread also because there was a certain stability of this, of the conditions, the temperature in which the, the planet Earth has been for the less, less, uh, last uh, 10,000 years. Um, in these uh, last, last uh, 10,000 years, um, human beings have developed uh, agriculture, a new relationship towards the other living beings where we domesticate plants and animals. And um, human beings have shaped a lot our planet. There is often the idea of uh, the planet was uh, intact, untouched, and uh, we have modified it. But in fact, since uh, at least 10,000 years, if you look at this uh, chart, you see here that the places that were not uh, shaped by human beings on planet Earth, and all these ecosystems were already shaped by human beings. So in fact, it's been already 10,000 years that the human beings have entered into very strong interaction with their environment, shaping them, interaction with other um, living beings, being be it animals or plants. And um, it has not changed uh, in, a, in a very important way for the last, last 10,000 years. Here you see the, 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 the beginning of croplands, uh, but very quite recently uh, has it been something uh, noticeable. This is uh, 300 years ago. So until 300 years ago, the modification was not very strong uh, of what uh, human uh, beings in general um, uh, changed in the shape of uh, the different ecosystems on, on the planet Earth. Um, is, is everything five fine for you? Yeah? Okay. Um, this has changed uh, uh, totally in the last uh, decades, I would say, more or less 100 years. Well, you see here the, the, the human uh, uh, um, population and the rate of area on land Earth that is intensely modified um, because these are uh, extensively modified, uh, um, modified at, at a small uh, um, uh, rate, uh, but you have all these type of, uh, ec uh, of uh, terrestrial systems that are strongly modified by human beings. And you see now that you have more than 50% of the, of, the, of the planet that is strongly modified by the action of human beings. And this has only happened in the very last uh, um, two centuries of few, or a few decades. Um, one of the parameters that has, yes? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I think this red line is about the, the human population and I don't have the, the, the axis here. I'm sorry, um, I would need to have a look at the article to be, to be positive, but I think it has, it's not linked with, the, with this question. Um, um, the other parameter that, that shows, uh, I mean, I, I hope now everybody uh, sees this when you are five years old at school on the whole planet, but I'm not sure it's the case, so I show it again. Uh, this is a very important uh, chart to know. This is the, the CO2 concentration levels, so dioxide carbon uh, atmospheric levels on planet Earth for the last 800,000 years. So um, what I was showing before was only this period. Huh? This is an uh, eight-time uh, longer uh, period. Um, and this is the, the rate uh, of variation for, for this nearly one million years of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere of planet Earth. That's uh, enabled all the life that we, know, we have known for one million years. And this is where 
the CO2 level of planet Earth atmosphere has shifted in the last 50 years. So it's just for people from the from the from the biogeochemical uh, uh, science, it's just completely unimaginable. I mean, nobody can tell anything about what happens when you do this uh, because it's um, it's a, it's a real life experiment of something something that is completely uh, uh, incredible in terms of what we can say about the states. Of, of how does a planet like planet Earth uh, can um, shift, change when such parameter, such important parameter as the concentration of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere changes to this uh, uh, importance. Um, some, so there's, there's been a lot of names that were given to this new era. The people from geology, they give names to period of, of Earth. Uh, we are uh, in the, the last period is called the Holocene, as I said, and um, uh, Mr. Crutzen made, uh, made a, a renowned propos proposal of calling Anthropocene a new uh, geological era in which we would be now, an era where the modification of the whole functioning of planet Earth is so intense that it, it is equivalent to, to naming a new uh, geological era. I don't know if you're aware of the other proposals that were made. Uh, I find them quite interesting because the first, well, one criticism was it's not a question of people in general. Anthropocene would saying like it's the people, the human beings in general. Uh, Andreas Malm said, no, it's capitalocene. So his point is that it's the capitalist organization that is problematic and not the people in general. Um, Frisso, Jean-Baptiste Frisso um, likes to talk about Thanatosen. Thanatos is death. So what he wants to defend is that there has been a movement of society that are promoting um, uh, violence and uh, war and, and death. And this, this way of, uh, of um, this characteristic of societies is a very much, it's, is a, a, the problem that could maybe state um, this this uh, this characteristic of a new era that changes uh, everything, and that thing talks about plantationo scene. So what she wants to say is that we have planted so many um, uh, plants um, everywhere. That's what I was showing before. That this has changed it radically. Uh, Benoît Monsanjo talks about the poubelle scene. Poubelle in French, it's the bin. So we are in a period where we have garbage everywhere. And if you think about people that could live in the next um, uh, thousand years, when they will look back at our period, what they will find is garbage of a lot of things, plastics, uh, 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 which we talk a lot about, uh, and all that kind of, uh, and all the pollutions that we find everywhere. Donna Haraway, she talks about Stulusen. Stulusen is a, is a, a funny word. Um, it's, a, it's the name of a, of a spider, and what she wants to put forward is that um, uh, we are in, an, in the, we are at least conscious, uh, uh, raising consciousness on the, the fact that everything is intertwined, and that there's a web in which human, humankind is so much deeply linked with other human, other living beings, and the state of the planet that we, we, we absolutely need to uh, be conscious of this link uh, uh, to go forward. Um, the, a, there was also a proposal of, uh, of uh, naming the Great Acceleration, this period of the last 50 years, mostly after uh, World War II, where more or less all the, the, the things that you could look at in terms of activity, of, uh, of human beings in general at the planet is going uh, high up. So here you see fertilizer consumption, primary energy use, water use. Uh, and here you see earth system trends, the carbon dioxide concentration or emissions, methane emissions, uh, coastal nitrogen, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we, we have encountered this in the last 50 years mostly, and uh, uh, in the last 70 years now, uh, since, since World War II, uh, this great acceleration. Um, the, this great acceleration brings um, state shifts. That means if you look at planet Earth today, 
uh, you could consider that it is at a certain equi equilibrium, what I was talking about the Holocene, it's always a dynamic uh, equilibrium, which means that the Holocene would not have lasted forever, it would have changed, but it had a certain stability. And um, the, what the humanity is doing by, by um, uh, emitting a lot of uh, um, gases or, or, or different molecules in the environment is changing the way that these uh, state um, stability works. And we are more or less promoting the possibility of a state shift that could lead the whole planet to go towards another state shift that's here. If you look at two examples, um, you have seas where you have coral and clear water. Another state shift, another possible state shift is algae in the, in the water and turbid water. So in terms of the human beings, you will have less diversity. You will have um, um, uh, another quality of water, which for bacteria could possibly not be a problem, but for uh, considered as a problem, but for human beings, uh, the possibility of uh, fishing, of having fish in, the, in, the, in this uh, sea, uh, the possibility of having great regulations uh, um, that make um, uh, these ecosystems work, uh, are of course completely modified and you have uh, less desirable and less valuable ecosystems uh, possibly in this in these uh, state shifts um I, I wanted to quote also this important uh, uh, book by jared diamond in 2005 if i'm not mistaken uh, called collapse where uh, he uh, put forward the fact that there has been there has there is always a strong relationship between societies and their environment and he described cases where societies uh, failed or succeeded to uh, change their way of being when there was environmental change. And uh, the book is, is a lot about societies that, that, that failed um, to, uh, to, uh, because of a strong modification of the state of their environment. Uh, so this question today is uh, posed at the level of the whole planet Earth. Um, so we are uh, today um, in a situation where the whole uh, way that the planet is working uh, is uh, uh, on the, the brink of that kind of, uh, of stage shift. Um, are you all already completely aware of what I've said or are there some new things and is it okay in the level of what you understand and it's fine? Should I keep on? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Maybe it's hundred percent known already for everybody. In, in which case, I don't need to say all this. But if it's if it's not totally uh, already, some of it. Okay. Because we have uh, already explored uh, some about the planetary boundaries from different perspectives and points of view, and uh, so I think it's half of something like that. I would say. I'm okay. Not sure because, uh, even though I am one of the ones who is programming the whole thing, okay. like the portugal, but, uh, but uh, you are listening. Okay, teaching is also about repeating and saying it elsewise and having other points of view. So um, uh, it's probably so something good. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, in terms of possible pathways, this describes how the planet Earth has worked for the, for the last million years. We have had um, um, periods of gl glacial uh, periods and what are called interglacial periods. Interglacial periods are periods where the planet Earth was less cold. Um, so we are today in an interglacial period, so the planet is quite hot. Uh, and it had been glacial for the last uh, 100 years, uh, 100,000 years before Holocene. Holocene is an interglacial period, so Holocene is here, and the planet Earth was before in this glacial sta uh, state. If you see um, representation of uh, human beings in uh, Europe, uh, in uh, North America, um, in, uh, in, uh, in Russia, in 20,000 years ago, uh, it was uh, it was mostly ice and very cold conditions, and this this stopped ten thousand years ago during the Holocene. Uh, what is uh, happening now, and what is already uh, going on, is that Earth has shifted towards another kind of uh, out of this loop, 
that had been going on for millions of years. And we are going on a new loop that nobody can clearly describe. And what is at stake is, um, are we going to go up on some kind of hot house earth, a very uh, uh, hot state, which could possibly in millions and millions of years or, or, or um, thousands, uh, tens of thousands of years come back sometime. But um, are we going, going up this way? Just to give an idea, um, the temperature that we could be uh, uh, going towards uh, if we keep on on this track has not been on the planet Earth since at least 20 million years ago. Uh, so it's even linking us to uh, incredible long uh, periods of time. The question of stabilizing Earth is about the possibility to uh, having an Earth system that doesn't go in this state. As I mentioned before, for many bacteria on Earth, being in this state is not a problem uh, at all. The question is, of course, how human beings um, are uh, uh, liable to be living a good life on Earth at this temperature, which, of course, nobody can uh, really assert anything about uh, uh, today with certainty. Uh, another um, representation of this question um, this is the, the glacial interglacial cycle. So the planet Earth has been going like this in the last uh, thousand years, uh, million years. Um, and we have started shifting planet Earth towards a new zone. And the question is, um, does it lead us to a uh, hot house Earth or does it, are we able um, to uh, react upon this? and um, to a, uh, an Earth that could be more or less stabilized in the state that we have known previously. Uh, this question of stabilizing Earth um, and the way it is formulated is interesting also, uh, because um, if you have the vision that we are capable of uh, managing this, it also gives the idea of the power of humankind uh, to possibly uh, steer the whole planet. Uh, which I think uh, poses a problem in terms of how we uh, consider ourselves um, uh, towards the planet. And that's um, people from the, the, the different biological, geological, uh, physical sciences um, are fully of, or, aware of the fact that we know very little. <laughs> we know very little of how planet Earth works. And so the question of steering the way that planet Earth will work is completely out of scope for humankind. One example is the question of tipping points. So there are possibly tipping points, tipping elements that could trigger um, changes in a cascade of changes for all other aspects of planet Earth. And it is very difficult to know what these tipping points are, at what level are they, and how are they interact one with the other. We cannot make a model of the whole planet and be sure how it will work. So um, this is one of the big questions. And for example, um, it is not impossible that we have passed some tipping points that will lead uh, more or less inevitably to uh, states where all the tipping points will act one after the other and lead to hot house earth. Uh, we cannot assert it with certainty. Um, on the other hand, um, the safer we go, uh, uh, the more chances we have that these tipping points do not uh, uh, happen. Um, this question of tipping points and the, the state of the planet um, is, can be described by certain parameters. Um, we can look and measure things on how uh, the planet Earth works, for example, the concentration of a gas in the atmosphere. And um, in the question of um, considering planetary boundaries, the idea was trying to find thresholds, uh, so, uh, uh, um, a level of these control variables, after which we think that we enter a risk zone, the risk that the whole planet Earth could shift into another state. There are we, we can say that there are, there are two kinds of, um, of way that the control variables of planet Earth work. The first one is um, control variables where there is a real threshold effect. Like you have one st state and you know, with, you're pretty sure that if you transgress this threshold, you will go to another state. And there are other variables where it's much less clear uh, because there is no 
there's nothing that changes in the shape of the curve. It's gradual a shift. So um, fixing the limits of the planetary boundary it, in this case uh, is a bit, little bit more difficult. Um, also, um, some control variables work very well at the whole planet Earth level. Others are more about local and regional Im impacts. Um, and the question is, how do you um, uh, articulate the analysis of these impacts of uh, mankind uh, modification of the environment at the regional level with a, a global vision at the, at the planet uh, level? Um, so that, that kind of, of control variable uh, has been, um, there has been a proposal to define nine control variables, um, which are called the nine planetary boundaries. Um, it was done uh, for the first time in 2009. So the concept is, is only 13 years uh, old. And um, these nine control variables have been classified in, in two types. Uh, those that are clearly at the planetary scale and those that, that act more at the local scale, at regional scales, uh, and that have been aggregated in order to give a, a whole view at, of planet, uh, 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 how a planet works at the planet state. And um, uh, other processes are processes with uh, global scale thresholds and the other, others, other processes, we do not know how they lead to potential uh, state shift of the planet Earth. There are changes that we can describe at the local uh, um, level, but we don't know how uh, it happens afterwards at the global, if it can lead to uh, global changes. So these uh, nine control variables that you see here are, um, have been defined as um, climate change and ocean acidification. These are uh, clearly um, uh, variables at the uh, global level because climate is uh, an ocean are mostly shared on the whole planet. So the question of uh, climate change linked to the concentration of gases in the atmosphere and the quality of uh, uh, water in the ocean uh, is something that is very much shared. The others are uh, in between the global scale and the uh, regional scale. Um, there are um, uh, stratospheric um, um, ozone, sorry, is a, the stratospheric ozone is also at global scale, um, the ozone layer. And the other that are more at the local scales are a global P and N cycle. P is for phosphorus, N is for nitrogen. So it's two, um, two elements um, that circulates on the planet Earth. Uh, atmospheric aerosol loading is the particles that you find in the atmosphere. Freshwater use, land use change, biodiversity loss, and uh, chemical pollution. So um, um, what I will do now um, is I will describe um, one after the other, these different control variables for you to know uh, what they are, how they are defined, uh, the state of their, uh, of their shift uh, at the moment. Um, and my specialty as a researcher is uh, global uh, phosphorus and nitrogen cycles. So um, what my proposal is that after having talked about all these uh, variables, I will, if, if it's okay for you, spend maybe a quarter of an hour to talk especially on this cycle because I know it very well and I work on it. And especially I'm working on how can we um, think of a modification of the way that human beings um, live on this planet uh, and, uh, and have a respect, respect these control variables for this. So I will go a little bit deeper on this variable um, and also try to link uh, the question of these control variables with the organization of societies. Um, yes? I, I still don't know if I understand that. I mean, like with the climate change, there is this kind of like threshold and you know that you will get to a, a clubhouse earth, right? And with the other ones, we don't know what happens after, or we don't know what is the... No, um, in general, um, it's, I think the main idea I think you should uh, keep in mind is that we are not able to say something about the experiment that is going on at the moment. We are changing things at a global level, at, at, at levels that are 
uh, incredible in terms of uh, I showed for the CO2, for example. And we are trying to model, to describe, have an idea of what is going to happen. But in fact, we don't know. <laughs> no, it is not possible to have made this experiment before and say we know what's going to happen. So in general, we don't know. What happened is that there has been a community of scientists who tried to make their best guess of what do we consider to be something safe to limit the risk of going towards a state shift. This best guess is sometimes uh, more or less difficult if we think that there are thresholds like this. And for example, with the tipping points, you have clear thresholds where you know that a glacier will melt and a glacier will not melt. So this is two states that are quite clear to define. Uh, but with other control variables, there is not something like this. So you don't have an abrupt change in the state, in the physical state. So it's more difficult to, to, to put this, uh, this uh, threshold limit. That is what I meant. But if for all of the variables that have been described here, um, it's only the, the, the planetary boundaries concept and description is only the state of what a group of scientists, it's not everybody, but it's already quite a big group of scientists have tried to put forward as the best guess of what we think are safe um, uh, states of planet Earth that could enable the possibility for human life to keep on as we have uh, just be able to breathe air and to drink water and to be alive. So that's the, the question. Is that clearer? More or less. <laughs> okay, maybe it will get clearer when I talk about the control variables in, in detail, then you have more uh, precise examples. Other questions? It's, it's okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, another thing to have in mind is that these control variables do not exist alone. They are all very much interrelated. So, for example, one of these control variables is biosphere integrity. And this is a mapping of the link between biosphere integrity and all the other control variables. So, you, you, at the same time, we, we, it's, it, we, it's easier to describe things by, by uh, separating them making different this problem and this problem, but at the same time, they are all linked and interrelated. So we also need to have um, um, an analysis of certain parameters, but at the same time, think of them globally. And here you see, for example, that biosphere integrity will be very much modified by uh, the impact of changes in nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, climate change, ocean acidification, of course, um, et cetera, et cetera, freshwater use. If there is no water, there will be no biosphere. And so there is a strong interaction uh, of uh, uh, most of them. Um, you have seen this before already, uh, this graph, yeah? Um, so um, this question of planetary boundaries, the first article was by uh, Johan Rockström et Ali in 2009. Um, there was a, a short article in Nature and there was a, a longer article. Then there were two articles by, well, I mean, Stefan and, and Rockström were both co-authors in 2015, and the, the last one in 2018. Um, they are working in the center, I didn't write all the letters, I'm sorry, is the Stockholm Resilience Center. And this center uh, um, uh, 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 updates uh, the question of planetary boundaries. So this, um, a uh, fig uh, figure has been uh, taken from um, the, the, the Stockholm Resident Center um, uh, website uh, where they have added um, uh, things from articles that have been published. There has been one special articles on, uh, article on uh, freshwater, and there has been another article dealing especially with novel entities that have uh, shown that these um, limits were transgressed. So maybe you will see other versions of this uh, graph where you don't have some of the, the planetary boundaries that are represented or not at the same level, it's because there had been evolution. So this is the last up-to-date representation of it. Uh, what do we see? We see that this proposal of the safe operating space, so uh, um, uh, a level of these control variables uh, in which we think that the, the, the stability of the system Earth uh, uh, could be uh, kept is transgressed for all of the planetary boundaries except two. Um, and there is only there is one that is not yet quantified. So 
In terms of what we hear uh, in the media, uh, we talk a lot about climate change at the moment, at least in France, uh, we hear a lot about climate change. Um, maybe a little bit also about biosphere integrity uh, with the, uh, the COP uh, in Montreal. Um, but what the, the planetary boundaries uh, uh, puts forward is that all these control variables interact one with the other, and many of them are also transgressed. And the idea is that if we are focused on the question of climate change only, then, and even if we solve, I would say, this problem, we still have all the rest. And so uh, it pleads for a, a large systemic approach of, on the, of the question. Um, so um, do you see the transgression of freshwater change, climate change, biosphere integrity, land system change, novel entities, and biogeochemical uh, flows um, uh, in terms of their, of their state? Um, there has been another proposal uh, by Kate Raworth in 2012. Um, about uh, a safe and just space for humanity. Um, she calls it the donut economics. Do you know about it? Yeah, already very much. Great. So I'll not, I won't go uh, uh, deeper into it. Uh, just to um, uh, put forward the fact that the question of inequality is very important. These are some examples of inequality on, on planet Earth. And uh, I like this article also by uh, O'Neill et al. in 2018. Uh, showing here the biophysical boundaries transgressed and here the social threshold that are achieved and showing that there is no country in the place where we, we would all like to be, a, a, a place where there is no transgression of the, the planetary boundaries and there is uh, a, a social achievement. Um, I like also the way that people formulate it. All countries are developing countries. Um, because uh, what we usually call developed countries uh, have gone into a development that is uh, detrimental and need to develop in this direction, uh, whereas uh, other countries um, uh, should not follow this path. That was maybe the path of what we call developed countries, uh, but better follow this path of going toward better social achievements without uh, uh, transgressing uh, biophysical boundaries. Did you comment on the position yes no no i'm sorry um it's a question i always have when i look at this i would love to uh, make a phone call to o'neill and ask him can you comment on it please um i think i discussed it not with him but with someone who was more or less close um who was it i don't remember and i think the person told me she believed it was more or less an artifact and not something really showing uh, uh that there is something specific in vietnam at the moment but i cannot tell you with certainty i'd love to if any of you know i'd love to know because i've been asking myself the question for four years <laughs> but i don't have time to dig into it <laughs> there's somebody from vietnam in the in this room no okay too bad it could be it could be something that really describes the difference between vietnam and the rest of the world but i'm i'm not sure it is because i mean this kind of aggregation of of, uh, of parameters can also show things that do not correspond so much to what happens. I mean, it's the limits, of course, of any work. So I, I couldn't be 100% confident for Vietnam. Uh, but while well, you can still have a look at all the countries that you come from uh, on, on, in, this, in, this, uh, in this graph. Um, so uh, let's go now uh, deeper into the, the, different, um, the different control variables. Um, so um yeah also i don't know what this this your state of your psychological state uh, in the question of uh, ecological disaster how i call it um i have gone through 20 years of depression anxiety and so on and then up and down and so on and now i am working on this topic and i'm working on how we can do things better so i am at i think at the moment and for a few years already very high level in terms of positive way of uh, uh, thinking it maybe you are not in this state what i've been t telling for the last uh, half an hour is disastrous uh, and maybe you are receiving it at something very hard in this case after 6 30 we can have a psychological debrief all together if you want or other people who want um, I'll be very happy to share uh, what I've been going through in the last 20 years on this topic, um, uh, because it's not easy, but 
um, maybe I can share at least what is my state of uh, mind at the moment. I don't um, think in terms of emergency, um, which we often talk about, ecological emergency and so on. And um, my uh, comprehension of the, of the situation is a, a very, very, very deep disaster. I mean, I consider that the situation is in terms of ecology and in terms of uh, uh, social way it is, is disastrous. I mean, we have uh, um, immense uh, inequalities in our planet between the countries and inside the countries. The ecological situation that you look through here is totally disastrous. I mean, that's how I, I feel it. And I feel much better now having um, um, integrated this. Okay. It's disastrous. Okay, now I am deep, deep, deep to the bottom of what I can hope. That's great. You can only touch the ground and then look up and say, okay, what do we do now? So um, that's the state I've been going to. Um, I don't say it's something that can work as a kind of magic for anybody at any time, but I'm just sharing that state of mind that I have and hope that if you encounter the same psychological difficulties as I have to go through this, um, you can maybe have inspiration in any kind of uh, uh, thinking of it. And when I will be talking about the nitrogen cycle at the end, I will also talk about what we are doing in terms of research and what we are trying to um, make uh, uh, work in, in, the, in our society in terms of actions. And I think this is also something very um, strong. The fact that you find an ability to do something, of course, it's always a drop in the ocean, but at least participate in something that goes a little bit more into the upper direction than into the lower direction. And I, I, I mean, I take my, my happiness and my energy in the very, very little state of this up going up slope. If I think I am a little bit contributing to this, it's just incredible. And ha having this moment with you now, I think it's something that goes a little bit more like this than like this. And so you cannot imagine how happy I am to be here with you. Um, okay, that's, that's the way I do. Uh, everybody does what he can. There's also the ostrich system. Yeah, you know, you put your head into the, into the sand and you, you do this and you do this. And yeah, it's, it's another way. You do what you can. Okay, but I'm just giving you tricks of what I, I ended up doing. Um, so, um, so having talked about disaster, I will talk about the only planetary boundary that is positive. There is at least one. It's incredible. That is positive. It's ozone depletion. Uh, and then you will have only bad news. Huh? Um, so um, ozone depletion, I believe you have all heard about this, the ozone layer, the hole in the ozone layer. So um, we have um, emitted specific, uh, and we are still emitting, but we have emitted a lot of specific uh, molecules that are mostly used in refrigerators uh, or in, sorry, hydrogen? hydrogen? Yeah, hydrogen also? Yeah, okay. Sorry? Yeah, okay, okay, in hydrogen production also. I know more about uh, CFC, but... Um, uh, and um, we have admitted them, them in, the, in the atmosphere. And in the 70s, there have been alarms about the fact that this could lead to the potential extension of humanity if there is no more ozone layer. And people said, OK, the molecule in the refrigerators could be so dangerous that humankind will be extinct. Can we change the molecule? So we, we had the people from the industry of refrigerators and said, can you change the molecule? Yes, of course we can. Okay, and we can, uh, don't, we can escape from humankind extinction if we do this. Can you do it? Yeah, okay, let's do it. So that's what we did. Uh, it's not finished. I put it a bit in a simplistic way, but more or less that's what happened with the Montreal Protocol in 1987. We have decided at the international level to change the, these molecules. And we have, managed to um, stabilize more or less the ozone depletion. And what is probably going to happen is that the ozone layer should be uh, built again. Uh, of course, it's never 100% sure, but that's the trend we are going towards. What's the technical part of like the this uh, specific gas and 
why only this? Uh, yeah. Sorry? Why this and not other type of pollutants? Yeah, so uh, uh, that's what I mentioned. I mean, I'm not a specialist of the history of ozone layer uh, politics. Um, the, the main history I know about is that it was a very, um, very narrowly limited problem in terms of techniques. It's the question of what is the molecule that you use in your refrigerator? Do you have another molecule? Yes. Can you use the other one? Well, yes. Can you just change the molecule in the refrigerator? Okay, let's do it. And that's what happened, more or less. So it was a very limited technical problem to solve. And the question was changing this molecule in the industry. I mean, it's not easy if you have built industries in all the countries of the world to make a certain molecule, and then you need to change. You need to change all your industries, all your factories, and the way that your refrigerators work and so on. But uh, not only the refrigerators, also the, the bombs and so on. But um, I was, the sprays, sorry, the sprays. Um, but uh, that's more or less, that was more or less the question. That, and it is still more or less the question. So I think that what made it possible is because it, it, it was a huge uh, stake for humankind and a very limited technical problem. So this was possible and was made possible by this international agreement of Montreal Protocol. There's also like a slightly more cynical way of thinking about it, I guess, is that um, at the time when the Montreal Protocol was coming about, the United States were always developing alternatives and they were really heavily affected so that led to their negotiating position in the Montreal Agreement. They were very much in favor of public service, whereas climate change, it's not so great for their economy. They can act, the government can't sanction stuff that would be negative impact. So, yeah, thank you very much for, for giving this. Uh, this uh, but well. Like the United States had a very, like, were very keen on passing this protocol because they were developing all, they already had alternatives. And they would be very negatively affected by the ozone hole. Whereas in comparison, they're really against like signing very restrictive agreements because there's an act of their parliament that their government doesn't have uh uh like they're not allowed to pass to agree to anything that would negatively impact the US economy. So whereas it was beneficial for them to do this and it's not beneficial for them to do it. All right. But I think the scale of what was in a question was also, is also much smaller than for the question of climate change, for example. And it's a sector of the economy that maybe uh, anticipated this change uh, that made it possible to have a, a concurrential position that would be positive for them if, if the change was acted. And I think the fact that this, the scale of the technical problem was, was small was, is also something very important if you want to compare it with the question of, of climate change. But uh, thank you very much for uh, going deeper into the question of ozone layer. Uh, so you wanted to say something? No, I thought. No, okay. Um, yeah, so that's the only one that is positive. Okay, now we have the eight control variables that are going worse uh, year after year. Um, so you know a lot about climate change. I'm not going to talk about it a lot. I am uh, not a specialist either. Um, so um, yeah, we are just pushing uh, toward forward greenhouse gas emissions uh, and uh, uh, having a hotter uh, planet Earth. Um, what goes with it is ocean acidification. Maybe you are not aware of this uh, planetary boundary, um, so I can talk a little bit more about it. Um, sorry? Oh, okay, great. Oh, well, you had the intervention on ocean. Okay, on the water cycles. Okay, so... Yeah, CO2 is in, CO2, the, the gas of uh, uh, the, the main greenhouse gas is an acid. So when it goes into the water, it makes the pH, so the, the measure of acid, uh, go lower. And when it goes lower, it dissolves um, what makes today uh, the shells of the, the living beings. You have seen this. Uh, okay, great. We'll go forward then. And this is the state of the control variable um, of acidification of the ocean. That is the pre-industrial state. And in the, in the control variables, you've seen the three colors that they put. That is the, the, the green is we are more or less quite sure that there will not be a state shift. The yellow is a zone of uncertainty and red is the zone of high risk. So the current state is already um, with many zones of uh, uncertainty. And a plus three degree world is more or less um, mostly in red zone and a little bit in the, in the yellow zone. 
uh, meaning that the 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 that the the ocean life of uh, most many organisms made of shell is not possible anymore in this state because the shells dissolve in the water. Why is there more acidification in the Arctic region? I am not a specialist of this question. I cannot answer. I'm sorry. Um, is it afterwards that you have a lesson on the ocean? There is somebody talking about the ocean afterwards. So it's afterwards, yeah? So he will be the person to answer this question. <laughs> Um, the third one is biosphere integrity. Uh, there are two control variables for this one. The first one is the extinction rate of the species on Earth. So um, there is supposed to have been a background of one extinction per million species year before. And uh, the boundary has been uh, put at 10. And the current state is uh, somewhere between 100 and 1,000. Uh, extinction per million species a year, which means that uh, we are in a high rate of biodiversity loss. Um, the other, uh, and, and, and considered to be uh, transgressed, the other one is functional diversity intactness, but this one is not yet quantified. There's only this map that shows places on Earth where the uh, mean species abundance, the abundance in biodiversity, has been uh, very much uh, uh, lowered. And it's more or less a map of the places where you have a strong uh, human uh, influence on the environment. Um, land system change is uh, the, the, another uh, planetary boundary uh, variable, um, very much linked to the others, of course. They are all linked one to the other. This one is uh, about the um, modification of the coverage of land on, uh, on uh, the surface of the planet. Um, so the idea is to have a, a, a proxy of how much we have changed um, uh, uh, our terrestrial environments. Uh, it's more about a local uh, variable, but it has been aggregated at a global level to give an idea uh, of what it, uh, what it does at the global level. Uh, it is considered to be uh, in, the, in these different zones, in, a, in the... In the Unrisky, risky, and high risk, uh, high risk zones, um, and a global at global level considered to be um, uh, in the transgressed uh, transgressed zone. Um, freshwater change. So this planetary boundary uh, was not quantified before six months ago, and there was an article by uh, Wong Ellenson et al. that was just a few months ago, two thousand twenty-two. And they, um, they, the proposal was to uh, put forward another control variable, with a, which they call green water. Uh, what they uh, want to, to put forward as a control variable is the moisture in the soil. So this shows the um, uh, land area on Earth, the percentage of land area on Earth where the root zone soil moisture, so the humidity that you have in the soil, uh, um, the fact that there is the possibility of life is linked with the presence of water. So if there is no water in the soil, you cannot have uh, uh, life or very limited. Um, and this is the, 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 this is the amount of places where we are out of the, um, uh, of the, of the bounds uh, that existed before in terms of uh, uh, soil moisture. And they, uh, using these control variables, they consider that we have uh, a, um, a high percentage of land area on Earth where there is either very dry uh, uh, soil or very wet soil, much more than before, and that this uh, corresponds to a, a planetary boundary transgression because it's one of the parameters of life this uh, uh, soil uh, moisture. The other parameter is blue water. Uh, blue water is just the quantification of how much water do the human society take out from the uh, hydro systems, from the rivers, from the aquifers uh, for the use. Uh, this one um, appears a green safe zone when it's aggregated, but the aggregation of this parameter um, doesn't give information about the local uh, states. So you can have, of course, uh, places where there are enormous tensions on the use of water and big and, and, and 
um, transgression of this limit at the local scale, but it's not considered to be a transgress if you have a if you look at the global scale of the the water cycles on Earth. Um, atmospheric aerosol lo loading. So this one is not quantified. It's more or less the pollution of the atmosphere. Um, what we can state is that human activities have doubled the global con concentration of aerosols, so particles, in the atmosphere since the pre-industrial era. So that's, again, the kind of parameter. If you change by a factor of two the way that something functions in our planet Earth and say, okay, this is going to make a stable uh, system, uh, it's very uh, <laughs> difficult to state this. Um, um, and um, the, the, the question of asserting this uh, variable is still a, a debate in the scientific community, and it has not been stated. Um, what is the, the control variable and what is its state? Even if, of course, we can analyze at very local uh, scale the question of air pollution. Um, another um, um, planetary boundaries that was has been very recently asserted is novel entities it was it's a paper in 2021 um so uh, the authors of this the authors of this article uh, put forward that the amount of novel entities so entities created by human activity that are in the environment uh, or at such level that we can consider that we have transgressed this control variables they use three uh, proxies uh, the first one is the proxy of production and volume of all the chemicals that produce all uh, the um, the human beings, to, all the societies of human beings on Earth. The other one is the concentrations that we find in the environment. Uh, and the last one is uh, the Earth system's effect that it, it can have, the, the, the global uh, action that, for example, um, uh, mole molecules that will be... Um, that will be a hormone that will make hormonal disruption uh, will have on animals uh, in the on planet Earth and human beings, of course. Um, so yeah, the, from this article, just this to show uh, the amounts of production of um, a chemical by the chemical industry, the question of plastics that we hear a lot about uh, that, uh, now, uh, pesticides. And, and different uh, um, elements to show that the, the, the production by humankind is going uh, very, uh, has been going very high in the, and going up uh, in the last years and is considered to be at um, a dangerous level by these uh, authors. Um, I am coming to my NNP biogeochemical flows um now so um i will go a little bit deeper into this uh, control variable and give uh, concrete examples of what um what it means to uh, analyze uh, a planetary boundary and think about uh, how we can um uh, act uh, uh, in front of this question mm. so the, the the maps show that the nnp planetary boundary is again a local a regional uh, control variable. It has been aggregated at the global level, but it's mostly a local uh, variable. And here you see the hotspots uh, on planet Earth where there is um, an ample disruption of the, the way that nitrogen and phosphorus circulate on, on, the, on the planet. And you see again the hotspots of um, mostly here intensive agriculture and the places where you have a, a lot of uh, human population. On Earth. Um, so um, nitrogen. Um, nitrogen is present on um, planet Earth in mainly two forms. Uh, the first one is um, what we call the inert form of uh, N2. So if you represent yourself nitrogen as an atom and you have two atoms together making a molecule, uh, N2 is present in the atmosphere at a rate of 80%. So at every moment now, when you inhale and when you exhale, you have 80% of the gas that goes into you that is N2. And this doesn't make anything to your body. It just goes into your lung and then it goes out again. We do not interact with this uh, gas, with nitrogen. And then there are many other different forms of nitrogen. So you have probably heard about nitrates, 
you have probably heard about ammonium. You've probably, maybe you've heard about uh, nitrogen protoxide, um, proteins, um, um, amine acids, all that kind of forms are what we call reactive nitrogen. It means that in this state, the atom nitrogen is in a molecule where it interacts with uh, living beings. So um, uh, the question of the planetary boundary is about the reactive form of nitrogen. Um, what happens is that when you introduce reactive nitrogen in an environment, you will have a cascade of effects uh, that will lead to uh, um, very detrimental effects on many different compartments on the environment. So uh, one of the main uh, entrants of uh, nitrogen is uh, the fertilizing uh, industry, um, the synthetic fertilizers, nitrogen synthetic fertilizers. Nitrogen is the food of plants and, and, and um, um, in, uh, putting uh, chemical fertilizers on, uh, on, on crop lands will make more production of, of uh, crops. So that's the reason uh, why there is an intense uh, uh, use of nitrogen in agriculture. But the more you use nitrogen, the more you have losses of nitrogen that will go in the atmosphere, in the water, and will make a cascade of effects. Um, the, the, the international group uh, working on nitrogen um, have put forward nine interacting problems uh, once you introduce nitrogen in an environment. These problems that you uh, are maybe aware of uh, is the problem of algae blooms. So you will have if, because nitrogen is the food of plants, if this nitrogen ends up in the water, you will have plants from the water that will grow. The plants from the water are algae. So uh, if you have a lot of nitrogen, you will have a lot of algae. And in the end, you will have nothing else. So if you only have algae, then that's what the environment looks like. And then the fish will die because there will not be enough uh, oxygen for them to breathe because there's too much uh, uh, of these algae. And you can also have uh, toxicity of the of the water because of the uh, development of some um, uh, harmful uh, microorganisms. Um, this is just to give an image of the Euro European uh, state of the question of eutrophication. There is um, one sea in northern Europe that is quite closed, uh, the Baltic Sea. And so uh, all the countries that are surrounding the Baltic Sea uh, have nitrogen input outputs that come mostly from, uh, but not only from agricultural lands and then to the rivers and then to the sea. And since the sea is quite close, there is intense eutrophication. And for example, the Baltic Sea is, a, is an example of state shift. I mean, there in many places in the Baltic Sea, you have no more fish or very little fish. And instead of having um, uh, bright water, you have algae and uh, uh, a very degraded uh, water. Uh, and you can see that the, this eutrophication happens also in, uh, in, uh, in the Seine estuary. So here we are in Paris. And if you go down the river, uh, you will end up in the Seine estuary that is also subject to this eutrophication. Uh, this map is, also, is about the rivers uh, in the European coast that lead to this uh, eutrophication. And here at the international level, uh, the, the places, it's mostly estuaries of rivers where you have a problem of uh, nitrogen imbalance that will lead to uh, um, uh, disruption of the ecological state of the estuary. And um, it has in, 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 uh, an important impact on the fish uh, that will be uh, able to uh, live in this environment. One important impact also is the question of the quality of water. Um, once nitrogen is put on, uh, on cropland, some of the nitrogen will go into the soil in the form of nitrates. And if you have too much nitrates in the water, it's not drinkable. For example, in France, we close one well every week because the, we have gone high, uh, over the limit of uh, drinkable water. Um, and this has happened for at least the last 40 years. So um, it's typically we were talking about the, the ozone layer and uh, why it has managed to shift and change. This is a typical example of it's been 14 years in 40, sorry, 40 years in France that every week we close a well because the water is not drinkable. And um, you have um, uh, an activity of uh, fertilizing lands 
that brings this, the, the water that is underground to be undrinkable for the next generations. Um, and this, I mean, in this, in this, in this topic, the, 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 the socio-technical locking is strong enough for it not to have changed. Um, uh, it's, a, it's an, an example. Um, it's uh, also very much related with the question of climate change, because every time there is nitrogen uh, introduction in the environment, some of the nitrogen will go in the atmosphere in the form of N2O. N2O is one of the three main uh, greenhouse gases. Yeah, so you don't know if you're aware of it. CO2 is the main greenhouse gas. The two others are CH4, methane, and N2O. Um, so every time there is nitrogen introduced in the environment, a, a, a percentage of it will go in the atmosphere in the form of N2O. So this makes a strong link between the nit nitrogen planetary boundaries and the climate change planetary boundaries. Uh, because one acts on the other, um, and vice versa, because nitrogen is produced in that kind of factory, and um, the, the, these factories, what they do is they need a tremendous amount of energy because they break this molecule of N2 that is in the atmosphere. Um, nitrogen in the atmosphere is a, is a fossil resource, as the same in the same way as we talk about fossil resource in uh, in fuels, uh, in uh, uh, petroleum, uh, coal, and so on. The nitrogen in the air that we breathe is uh, more than a million years old. It hasn't changed for a million years. And what we do in this industry is breaking this bond of these molecules, uh, of these uh, um, fossil molecules, we could we could call them. And this needs enormous amount of energy and uh, puts this nitrogen in this in circulation in planet Earth and brings all the modification that I have uh, uh, um, talked about. Um, to give a, an, um, an idea of the, the importance of nitrogen production, uh, it's about 2% of all the greenhouse gas emissions of humanity that are linked with the single uh, production of uh, nitrogen in, the, in these industries. Um, so, um, if we think about the question of ozone layer and what is the problem, you can say, okay, the problem is the molecule that you use in the fridge. Can we change the molecule? Okay, the industry in the US is ready to change. Okay, let's change and then it goes. So I, I have the same way of thinking the question of nitrogen. Okay, what's the problem of nitrogen? The problem of nitrogen is the basis is this. We need to eat nitrogen. Okay, if you don't eat 3.4 kilogram of nitrogen per year, this nitrogen is present in the proteins. So when I say 3.4 kilogram of, of nitrogen, it's the same thing as saying you need to eat proteins. Okay, we all need to eat proteins. If you don't eat nitrogen and phosphorus, then uh, if, you if you eat less, you, you will be sick. And if you don't eat at all, you will die because you need to eat it. That's the, 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 the need for us. And uh, the, the fate of human beings is that our organisms uh, don't keep this nitrogen. Um, if you uh, weigh yourself, if you put yourself on a scale to weigh yourself after one year, you will have this, you will weigh the same weight. So it means that everything that has come inside has gone outside in some way. And you find in your excretions uh, the same amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that what was um, eaten by the people. <laughs> Sorry? Because uh, our physiology is very limited. Uh, I am very much in admiration of plants because plants, they eat the nitrogen in the soil and they can eat uh, nitrogen in the mineral form. They can eat nitrogen from rocks, more or less, I could say. We cannot eat rocks. We can only eat living animals. So we are much less evoluted <laughs> than plants. Second thing, when the plants take some food, they keep it to build the plant. And we are not able to keep the food that we have eaten and just make it circulate again. And then we can just stop eating. We need to eat and we need to excrete. And that's the human condition. So that's just the way our bodies work. And that's the condition. It's something that you could say is um, less um, uh, remarkable than a plant. But at the same time, it's also remarkable in terms of interaction because we need to eat uh, proteins and we excrete uh, our nitrogen. Uh, does, does anybody know the way, the main way that we excrete our nitrogen? To the urine, yes, exactly. 
we have too many excretions. Huh? You know the two main excretions, it's urine and fecal matter. Um, so it was the good, um, the main nitrogen excretion is in the urine in the form of a molecule that is called urea, that, uh, urea. that is a fertilizer that is used by, uh, by many uh, uh, farmers. And the plants, uh, to answer to your, to your question, the plants, they eat urea. And when you give urea to a plant, they will make a protein. So in the, if, you, if you grow uh, wheat, for example, to make bread, you will have a lot of proteins in the wheat grain. And then you can eat this wheat grain uh, and you will excrete urea. So at the same time, I find that animals have a physiology that is much less um, developed as, uh, than plants. But uh, on the other hand, it's also an interaction with the plants, a mutual dependency between animals and plants. Um, I, when I started doing some research, so this was, uh, this was uh, uh, now eight years ago, um, I, I, had, I hadn't done research uh, after a master's degree. So um, the people who, who told me I could do some research told me, okay, you should do a thesis. So that's why I started to do. I, do, I did a PhD, but a bit later than what most people do. Um, and my thesis is about the nutrition excretion systems. Um, if you could rephrase the question of my PhD and the research that I'm still doing is, okay, we have a nitrogen plant, planetary boundary. Uh, what is the problem and how can we help solving them? Okay, the basis of the main problem is that we need to eat and excrete. How can we think of a way to eat and excrete that could be compatible with the respect of a planetary boundary. That's the main question of the research I do. I wrote um, a 500 pages thesis on the question. It's in French. So I'm sorry if you cannot, if you don't speak French, read French, read the whole thesis. But if you go on our internet site, I, it's in the, in the end, you, you will have a lot of documentation in English also that you can, that you can read about. But uh, that's more or less the, 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 the topic I, I work on. Um, so, the, uh, I showed that many of these control variables have, uh, have changed after World War II. The question of nitrogen is totally linked with the question of uh, fossil fuel use and industrialization, because the, the main trigger of a change is this process, the Haber-Bosch process, the process I described, the possibility of industrially um, um, breaking this molecule of N2 into the form of nitrogen that will be uh, that can be used by plants as a, a fertilizer. Uh, some people state that this invention in the 20th century is the invention that has changed most the life on Earth of uh, mankind. Um, for example, if you take the nitrogen that is in your body and the body of all the people on Earth, the 8 billion people on Earth, one out of two molecules of nitrogen have gone through that kind of uh, factory before going into your body. So the existence of the half of the humanity today, if you could say so, is totally linked with uh, these, um, these factories. So it has also participated to the, to the, to the number of people that we are uh, today. Um, there's a very interesting uh, um, quoting by uh, the biologist Lotka in 1924. He um, uh, writes about this uh, Aberbosch process, and he says, we are entering a new geological era. It's the same idea of the Anthropocene, but it was already 100 years ago. And uh, he says, we are changing totally the, the, the quantity of nitrogen that is... Um, uh, um, uh, cycling on the planet and that we are introducing on the planet. There are some uh, microorganisms, it's quite limited on Earth, but it exists. There are some microorganisms that can fix this nitrogen, that can take the nitrogen in the atmosphere and make it into a form that is reactive and that can be um, uh, taken by plants. And this is the, the, the sum of all the fixation of nitrogen by all the microorganisms on the planet Earth. And what um, the introduction of fertilizers is doing is that we have doubled the quantity of nitrogen that is uh, currently um, uh, uh, circulating on planet Earth. Um, I have, um, in my thesis with, uh, with, with colleagues and mostly with uh, Julia Lenoé, we published an article that shows how this um, nutrition excretion system works in uh, the case of Paris. 
So um, we have compiled data of what do people eat in the city of Paris, well, the, the, the whole um, uh, agglomeration, the whole uh, urban um, zone. Um, where does this come from? So we have tried to trace all the molecules of nitrogen uh, upwards and also uh, downwards. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show this uh, briefly. My, um, I told you that my discipline was biogeochemistry. Um, I'm, I'm um, very much in interested into understanding the problem of this unsustainability of our world and what we can do. And I think that's a, a basis of understanding is describing what's happening in terms of biophysically, um, uh, uh, what, what is happening physically. So my job is to count how matter circulates in the, in the planet and trying to give a view of this. Um, usually, uh, I make some kind of a comparison with the question of counting the euro or the dollars. Many people, they count the dollars. Um, I don't think that counting the dollars give any information about the question of the sustainability of the system. I think counting the dollars gives mostly an idea of the power relationship between some actors. Uh, usually, the one that gets the money is more powerful than the other one. But it doesn't give an idea of it. It also gives an idea of how much time some people work. This is a, um, a parameter, that I, of course, very important. But um, what we are trying to do in our, in our approaches is to count the materiality of what happens. Um, and then in terms of decision making, uh, I believe that basing decision making on accounting of what is materially happening is something very important that we need to do. And that's why I'm, I'm very interested in doing that kind of uh, approaches. Um, yes? I was just uh, wondering, I, I think we are getting there, but uh, I think we would be very interested also, and we have 25 minutes, so uh, if you want to go back to the uh, Yeah, I will. I will, I will talk about them. Uh, I mean, I will talk about uh, them just short after this presentation. Um, we have started with quarter of an hour uh, delay. I'm sorry. I don't know if we can keep on quarter of an hour more afterwards. No. Okay. So we'll finish earlier. I'm sorry. Those who want or who, who can, I'll, I'll be happy, but I will finish at, at, at half past six. Um, so um, in, uh, in Paris, uh, we eat about five kilograms of nitrogen, which is 50% over the physiological need that we have. So this is the first uh, 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 problem that we can uh, trace. Of course, we excrete all this uh, uh, quantity. Then in the agricultural systems, we have uh, more or less 25% efficiency of the use of nitrogen. So we have a, a four-time factor of the need of nitrogen uh, 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 before. Um, and if you look at what we do with our excretions in, uh, in France, we mostly um, urinate and defecate in water. Uh, we flush the water. Uh, it goes in the sewer that goes to a sewage treatment plant. Uh, the sewage treatment plant was uh, designed to protect the river from these uh, nutrients. Um, in order to uh, not to have these algae blooms, but these wastewater treatment plants are not able to uh, uh, keep the nitrogen because it's diluted in the water and very difficult to keep. So we have only 0.2 kilograms of this nitrogen that is available uh, and uh, eventually recycled because it's put the sludge or put on the on the croplands, but they contain very little nitrogen. So that's the description of the unsustainability of the system uh, with a lot of uh, nitrogen emissions on the, on the way. Um, if we want to go towards, you were talking about solution, uh, if you want to go towards uh, sustainable nitrogen cycles, uh, this uh, shows the three main levers where you can act, what you eat, how you produce food, and what you do with uh, your excretions. Um, diets, agricultural practices, and management of human excreta. Um, diets, here is the GDP of the countries of the world, and here is the protein consumptions. So what you see is that the more developed you are, the richer you are, the more protein you eat, and you eat much more protein than what you need. This is the place of France. Plus, you eat a lot of um, animal protein, Again, very much linked with the GDP of your country. Um, so this um, 
shows a, a, a trend of the way that uh, enrichment of the country has acted. Uh, it has acted in a way that people eat much more protein than they need. And uh, a great deal of these protein will be automatic, well, very quickly excreted by the body because it cannot use it. Um, but it makes the whole economy of uh, food production uh, uh, turn and produce all this uh, unnecessary food. Um, food production can be uh, deeply changed. Um, this is an article published uh, by, uh, lead, led by my uh, colleague Gilles Bilen in 2021. It's a proposal of reshaping the European agri-food system. So this is a description of how we could imagine that would work the nitrogen flows between uh, croplands, grasslands, livestock, and the human population. This article shows the possibility of zero nitrogen, uh, um, zero um, artificial fertilizer use to uh, uh, feed the whole uh, Europe. Uh, it has been also developed at the world level. I don't have the, the slide here, but there has been also a, a work on the question of can mankind get out of the use of these nitrogen fertilizers? And our answer is yes. Um, so, um, for example, in 1945, after World War II in France, uh, there has been um, a transition of agriculture toward this industrial agriculture with a high use of uh, nitrogen fertilizers. And um, the, um, the, there was a group that was promoting what they called normal agriculture. And this kind of normal agriculture could have fed France. I mean, the, 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 the trajectory that we have had was not to feed the people, mostly. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, organization of uh, promoting um, the higher level of production of agricultural products um, that, that, that uh, made us come to a system that, where we are. But it's not a necessity in terms of the materiality that could uh, our agricultural um, systems work. Um, one of the uh, conditions of this uh, system is a change in the diets. Um, so the, the main proposal is to um, uh, swap the proportion. Today we have two thirds of the proteins that we eat that are from animal origin in France um, and uh, in Europe in general. And the main idea is to uh, revert them and have only one third of these proteins that would come from uh, animal uh, uh, products and two other thirds that would be vegetal, so a more vegeta vegetal diet. The other one is the, is the use of uh, natural nitrogen fixing uh, plants and reconnecting crop production and, uh, and livestock. And uh, the third, um, the third uh, question is the management of uh, pea and poo, of urine and fecal matter. This is even more specifically the topic I'm working on. Um, I have to tell you that when I tried to have funding eight years ago to say I would love to work on this topic, it was not very easy. Um, at least people usually smile or laugh at it when they discover it, uh, so it makes it easier to uh, start talking about it. Uh, but I'm really, um, I've, we have been living an incredible moment in the last years in France because this topic is, that topic is really growing a lot. And we are doing more and more research and working with more and more people to work on the possibility of managing elsewise um, uh, urine and fecal matter. Um, you have here uh, two con contrasted options of managing. So this image is an image that, was, uh, that is from Japan in the 18th century, showing people with urine and fecal matter from the city going to the fields. And here you have a, an image of a city in France, uh, the same period with the people who are uh, dumping urine and fecal matter in the river. Um, this is to show that there have been different uses of these uh, materials in history. And again, the question is totally open of what should we do with our uh, uh, urine and fecal matter. We are interested in source separation. If you look at the volume of what we call wastewater, the water that goes out of your house, you have about 150 liters of water and the volume of urine and fecal matter is very limited. It's only 1%. But if you look at the quantity of matter, matter that is inside, for example, nitrogen, nearly everything is in 
uh, urine and fecal matter. So we are working a lot in source separation. Can we manage them out of the water? Um, and we consider them as a fertilizer. Um, my, my first um, uh, proposal would be for you to do it. Um, I had a, my first PhD student who did this. So he puts uh, some uh, seeds in pots, one without urine, one with. Of course, that's something that was known by everybody uh, for uh, uh, centuries. Uh, but in France, most people have totally forgotten about it, don't know about it. So we did a thesis on it. Uh, of course, not only to show that it was a fertilizer, but also to characterize more precisely how it can be used as a fertilizer. Um, we uh, develop a lot of proposals also for people to uh, re, um, uh, 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 rediscover uh, the possibility of using your urine. I, I love this, um, this um, a watering can that was developed by a Swedish lady. Um, it's a sweet watering can you can sit on. It's for, it's, for, uh, it's for ladies. And you can pee directly in it, so then it's much easier to use it as a fertilizer. Um, that's another French book also published with, and, uh, and recommendation by our, our Swedish uh, colleagues. The, um, interest in the specific interest in urine is that um, there is very low risk of contamination with pathogens in urine and as you mentioned before the main uh, fertilizing uh, um, possibility is in urine uh, more than in the fecal matter so it makes it very simple to fertilize with urine and anybody can test uh, like Tristan did in his thesis the fertilizing uh, use of urine um, there is a tremendous development of new devices. So this is a dry uh, male urinal. It already exists, but uh, dry uh, male urinals, but this one doesn't have water. So it's easier to collect the urine. This is something we have um, uh, developed in our research team. It's a female urinal. So the idea is to have a device specifically designed for uh, um, uh, ladies to uh, collect only the urine. And here you have example of urine separating toilets. Um, the last one being this one, uh, another one also like this to separate uh, liquids and, and solids and have a separate management of urine and fecal matter. It leads to new, new products. Um, our colleagues in, in Switzerland have uh, put on the market the very first um, fertilizer made of urine. Um, uh, it was uh, marketed in 2018. It's concentrated urine uh, that can be uh, bought uh, uh, and as a, as a fertilizer. And there's a lot of research going on and how can we dry urine? How can we mix it with other um, elements to make it a convenient fertilizer? Um, the main question that I think, yes? yes. I was gonna, I would say that I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Can you repeat? Is uh, human urea, is there a problem to use it for uh, uh, vegetable, like, uh, for, like production, human production, like for vegetable, fruit, yellow, or anything? Oh, okay. Uh, so um, there's a. I, I think that the, um, a majority of human societies, if you think of the history of humankind for the last millennia, has used uh, urine and fecal matter as fertilizers. That was something very common in the history of humanity. Um, but it is something that is quite uh, rare at the moment, uh, especially in France. So uh, if we introduce again this use of urine, there is a certain number of precautions that have to be taken. Um, the risks are, I would say, mainly two risks. The one is the risk of pathogens. So if um, you have pathogens in the urine, there's a risk of transmitting it on a crop. And then if you eat the crop, so maybe it's what you were thinking of. Um, what the WHO, uh, so the World Health Organization, has published recommendation about the use of urine. And what they state is that if you uh, store the urine, it will uh, get sanitized because urine is rich in nitrogen in the form of urea that becomes ammonia. And ammonia is a sanitizing uh, chemical. So um, if you just store it long enough, 
it is considered by the WHO as safe to use. Then you can transform it, as I showed here. This transformation makes it sterile, but if you don't transform it this way, just storing is enough. Now, if you are at the garden level of your own home, there is no uh, question of the pathogens because you already have them. Um, but if the question is about for other people, storing urine is considered as something safe. Yeah, the second one is micropollutants. So uh, it's mostly um, medicine residues. Uh, for this, uh, for these uh, molecules, the WHO states that considering the fact that these molecules are not managed, today they finish in the water, they finish uh, also in the sludge sometimes, and then go back to the, to the land. And um, the fact that there is much more antibiotics in the urine of cows and pigs that we put on the soil today than in the urine of uh, human beings. And the fact that there is no study that has shown an impact today, there have been studies, but they don't conclude. I mean, we see these molecules, but then we cannot uh, analyze the effect they have. The WHO says uh, we consider that we can still use urine as a fertilizer, even if there's micropollutants. But some scientists, there is no, um, it's, a, it's a real scientific debate today. Some scientists says we do not know the impact, so maybe we should not do. And it's a question that is still open. And some other people, again, I, I, I'm talking about my, my, my Swiss colleagues here. Um, they say if you separate the urine, then it's much more easier to do something with this micropollutant if you want to treat them, for example. So it's also an easier way to manage this, this uh, question of micropollutants once the urine has been separated. Um, so in the, in the last, uh, uh, well, 10 minutes now, uh, uh, we will have, I will, we, we can talk if you want about this question of the socio-technical lock-in because the question of the emergence of alternatives in terms of the, the food uh, uh, production or in terms of the urine and fecal matter management is a question of socio-technical lock-in. You, you are aware of this um, conceptual frame, framework? Um, some, some seem to say no. So it's a framework developed by, by uh, Rails uh, mainly. It states that once a society works in a certain way. Um, everything is organized around this way of working. So the culture, the infrastructures, the technology, the, the knowledge, the industries, and uh, it, it makes a lock-in around a way of functioning. And this locking is very strong and makes it very difficult to move uh, uh, to, not to other states. And it, it can move because there are some niche some, some uh, actors that, that promote other options, and also because the landscape, the, the conditions in which the society exists change. So one of the things we study is how can the niche in the question of uh, source separation uh, and the landscape modification at the moment, uh, energy uh, prices that are going high, for example, can change the state of how we are today locked in in France, we are locked in in the flush toilet and the sewer in the way to manage our, our urine and fecal matter. Um, um, so I'm working in the, on this topic in the OKP program. Um, we are a, a big team working on, on different uh, aspects, a multidisciplinary approach on, on this question. Um, here are the different partners of the OKP program. And um, I, I, I'll finish my slides with an example because maybe you heard, heard about... Um, um, MT 100, how is it in English? Is it also MT 180? It's my thesis in 180 seconds. So once you have a PhD, you, you have a, a competition of talking for three minutes of your thesis. So you can find Fabien Esculier on YouTube uh, talking for three minutes instead of two hours uh, on, uh, on, on these questions. And I, I talked about this by showing um, this um, image of collecting urine, uh, growing wheat with it and making bread and showing a new way of circulation of nitrogen. And uh, the nice fact with the uh, work I'm doing in my program is that um, we have started collecting the urine a few years ago at our university. And uh, with my colleague Tristan, we have made experiments on, on wheat uh, that we have grown. And we found also a baker that said, okay, great, you have made flour from wheat that was fertilized with urine. That's a new way of considering our interaction in the society. I'd love to make bread with it. So we made bread, and now we are also making biscuits that I have brought with me. So um, I, I told you that it would be um, 
uh, even some, if some uh, things were talking about disaster, I would finish with something positive. So this is the example of what public research is doing at the moment. We are uh, fertilizing uh, crops with uh, human urine and we are making biscuits to show the possibility of doing something else. And uh, well, we can share this if you want. Uh, they are just fresh. This, these we've made uh, two weeks ago, um, and uh, we can discuss about either this specific question or more largely the question of planetary boundaries, if you if you want. While we are eating our our biscuits, uh, of course you don't have to eat them if you don't want to. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Fabian. That was, uh, as usual, very interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I think we have spent more time on the end. I'm very sorry that it happened very late. Please, do you have some questions? Even though if you have more questions for Fabian, you may uh, just uh, run to him and see, because this program is really fascinating. And you ask for solution. He works very concretely with the city of Paris. And you'll find his toilet somewhere in Paris, in the next person's school also. So this is a kind of maybe a few uh, new shit. So is there other questions for him? I know it's late, I know everything, but you know, we're talking about peace, so that should be it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just a very practical question because um, I heard um, from some colleagues in the like city management or urban, urban management, there is a big problem with the trees dying from uh, piss from uh, dogs and that only some uh, like species of trees can uh, survive the amount from all the dogs in the city where there is not a, uh, such a big amount of trees. And um, yeah, I thought uh, of this and for, for a long time that urine is not very uh, good for uh, yeah na nature or like for, for plants. So is it a, like a complete myth or is the, there some like different reasoning behind it? No, it's not a myth. In fact, it's a question I ask myself, what is the amount of dog piss on each tree in, in uh, Paris, for example? And to which state is it a correct fertilizing, fertilizing of these trees? The problem you're talking about is over fertilizing. If you put too much fertilizing on the plant, it will die. So the best thing, for example, some people told me, oh, I piss every evening. So usually it's men who tell me this. I piss every evening in my garden, so it's good to do it. And the answer is, okay, there's other aspects than just fertilizing when you do this, okay? Uh, that re regards the question of uh, peeing in your garden and the other people you share your garden with and the people around, so this is an aspect. But if you think only of the question of fertilizing, you should not pee every time at the same place. You should fertilize um, the idea is one day of pee is fertilizing one meter square. So if your garden is uh, 365 meters square, you can just change meter square every day and you will have fertilized your whole land. And if you grow crops on it, then it's perfect because then you can feed yourself with what you have used. So your problem is a problem of over fertilization. Are there other Yeah, is this what you were talking about the... uh, is it working the the, the microphone? Yeah, okay 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 um just like the question like when you were showing the circle of like working with the experimental like growing crops and then working with the bakery like is this also part of your research or is this just yes. like, a fun activity like no 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 no, no, no. it's 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 uh it's the core of what we are doing as research we are doing um action research so our aim is we try to define what we work on in terms of how can it have the, the, the biggest possible impact on the question of the unsustainability of our world. And um, we, I mean, in my thesis, I address these questions in more theoretical way, but at the same time, articulated with some actors. You, you talked about the city of Paris, for example, I met some people from the city of Paris. I talked about it, about it in, the, in, the, in the, that moment. I was not the only one, of course. And so there was a community that started to grow and uh, things went forward on the question. And then in, I had the, the possibility of um, doing this PhD thesis with, uh, with Tristan Martin. 
and we we did the experiments about the question, scientific question that we ask ourselves about the use of urine micropollutants that, that we mentioned we had we have studied also how why and uh, how and to which rate should we fertilize with urine which product is most suited should we concentrate urine or not before using so that's all the question that we asked but one of the important aspects of our research was make it an action research so uh, at the same time uh, question the thing and at the same time um, demonstrate and help people in the society apprehend the question talk about it diffuse the information and and help it uh, uh, work also so for me the the it's philosophically important. The, the production of these biscuits for me is totally a, a part of the way that we are that we are working, and I think that um, research today it has a, a, an enormous potential of, of uh, because we we need. If you look at the 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 report by the IPCC, it's written that we need to radically change everything in our lives, <laughs> more or less, uh, and. There's uh, uh, so many uh, people who are um, working on how this could work, and the theoretical work has advanced a lot. And the, there are many practical people who are uh, practical examples of people implementing it. And uh, I am living at the moment a very strong positive interaction between research and action, uh, because I, I'm thinking of uh, participative housing in in Europe. There's a, in France, in Switzerland, for example, in Sweden. There's lots of participative housing. People who um, uh, design their house and decide how they will make it in a group, and we are helping them implementing that kind of solution. So, for example, uh, in Brittany, there is a new uh, participative housing where they will uh, spread the urine on the land that is just a few uh, kilometers uh, next to their, to their house. And it's working thanks uh, not only be, uh, to, uh, because of this, but also because we have this strong link between research actors and people implementing it. And um, that's something we are very much working on. And I, I think there's an there's a enormous potential in, in these kind of developments. Um, so I talked about participative housing, but you mentioned city of Paris as, as an example of community also. Uh, um, there was a question. Yeah, so. um, it is just like a fun fact. It's fun. Basically, when I come from in, in Mauritania, we have this concept called the evil eye. And when you get the evil eye, basically you have to take a shower with your mother's urine to take off the evil spirit. And so it's basically another like use of urine, more or less. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't 100% uh, understand what you said. Yeah, so there is what they call like the evil eye, which the is when someone is jealous eye. from you. Evil eye, okay, yeah. sorry. And so in, in order to exorcise the uh, evil eye, yes. you have to take a shower with your mother's urine basically urine ah okay yeah. okay thank you for the so there's there's plenty no it's very interesting there's plenty of knowledge of different people about things that can be made with urine you have medical application you have a fertilizing application you have industrial applications and i'm very much interested also in understanding how these work because in france there's a lot of knowledge of urine that has disappeared but there's still a lot of knowledge that exists and these are very interesting in, in many uh, in many ways, also with the cultural and symbolic exactly, uh, yeah. situation of urine that will uh, explain how societies uh, interact with it. Yes, yeah. you were. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for the presentation. Um, I imagine in your journey already, you've probably met uh, um, representatives of food industry and fertilizer industry and how was it how how is their approach to what you're doing developing are they friendly or not um, um mostly today if you look at the state of france it's mostly a uh, niche today the, the this emergence of uh, of uh, alternative fertilizers from from urine and and uh, and fecal matter also but mostly urine uh, so today, I think the position of the industrial uh, fertilizing industry is more considering uh, a very small niche somewhere here. It's it was it's more like this, I would say, at the beginning. So disinterest just because it's so small niche. But there has been quite a shift. Like the 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 price of nitrogen has risen uh, four times in France in the last month. And it has changed a lot of things that were just a month, uh, month, months ago. Okay. So 
in a description of materiality, the nitrogen flows, we've been saying this, I mean, we, not me, but other people for decades, but now the, the dollar <laughs> indicator has changed and suddenly whoop, you have a lot of actors saying, oh, there's a problem with nitrogen because it costs a lot. Yeah, this problem was still here, <laughs> already here decades before. So um, there is a change going on at the moment in this question. I think um, one of the main question is the question of power of organizations. So one option for the fertilizing industry is incorporating new fertilizers in what they can sell. If they do this, well, they could, they could just take urine fertilizers, change nothing, and, and just incorporate it in what they do. But the question of, uh, of the, the changes that I mentioned in, in terms of, um, of the, the systems I talked and then the, the food production, when you go into the zero uh, nitrogen uh, um, uh, synthetic fertilizer uh, use in agriculture, this is a much bigger disruption than the question of UC using urine. And this, I mean, it's been on the table for 70 years in France now. The people who have said we do not need uh, nitrogen fertilizers to feed ourselves and the detrimental effects of them in the water, in the, in the atmosphere, in our health, and the cancers that we have because of it are not uh, do not plead for keeping on like this. This has been locked for 70 years. So on this point, <laughs> uh, the people who promote other paths have always been much less powerful than the industries that promote it. And I think this is a very easy parallel to make with the fossil fuel industry. I mean, the, the, um, the lobbies of keeping on on this path are much stronger than the lobbies of what Bruno Latour called the ecological class. I mean, there is... Um, 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 uh, sorry, um, it's it's. Uh, I'm losing my words. Um, there is a fraction of the population that has an interest into stopping these pollutions that is much bigger than the fraction of population that has an interest into keeping in with it. But the political class, the, what Bruno Latour calls the ecological political class that has the same interest is not united and not stronger than, than the small class that has interest. So this state has been going on for 70 years and we are still in it. So. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have two questions. The first one is about um, the, uh, I've talked with an engineer talking about a way, a solution to, uh, to treat the, um, our fecal ma uh, matter, uh, which is a phytosanitary oriented solution. Okay. Like using different layers of uh, plants, algae in our in our garden to treat them, like okay. to to create a matter. Uh, I want to know if you have any, if it's a good solution we have to to yeah. look at. And the second question is about uh, Adi Blue, uh, like because I I think the Adi Blue is created if I is using a pig uh, urea or something, no. I'll answer the second question first. So uh, Adi Blue is a, a, a twenty liter. Um, um, uh, uh, jerrycans that you can find and put in the motors for depollution of the nitrogen emissions. Uh, it's uh, synthetic urea. Uh, it's just synthetic urea made by the by the industry of nitrogen. Um, it would we would need to extract specifically urea from human urine. And human urine contains also phosphorus, contains potassium, contains uh, um, iron, contains copper, contains a lot of elements that are beneficial. So if we start to separate just the nitrogen because you use it for the industrial activity, what do you do with the rest? And if the rest is useful for the agriculture also, just you can keep it and use it as a fertilizer. That's my opinion on it. Um, and, and so, well, that's, that's mostly what I would say. Uh, second, then you mentioned um, a reed bed. So if you grow plants, it's a technique that is employed mostly for treating wastewater. Um, it's not the reeds that treat, it's the microbes are mostly. The reeds are just here to, to make a structure uh, with, the, with the roots. Uh, it's used mostly for wastewater. I don't know any use specifically for fecal matter. If you treat wastewater that has urine plus fecal matter plus the the use the water the gray water you use for shower and with that kind of uh, device, you will not collect the nitrogen and the phosphorus. The, it, it's still the same linear thing as the wastewater treatment plants. So the plants they 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 take some, but they take like two percent, three percent. 
of the nitrogen. So it's not a solution in terms of circular management of the nutrients in, of nitrogen and phosphorus, but it's interesting. Uh, I, I find uh, a lot in if you are if you want to have a circular management, it's interesting in terms of treating the gray water if you separate the urine and fecal matter. And of course, there are lots of situations where circularity is not the main point, and it can be a treatment of your wastewater also. Um. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Fabian. You're welcome.